Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the wonderful Sarah Snook to talk all about HBO's succession. And one of the things I wanted to start by talking about is I've heard you kind of mention that part of your process with the scripts, and especially because obviously there's so many of them when you're in season and they're coming so rapidly, is to kind of go through and make really, really detailed notes for Shiv, and especially kind of writing down a lot of what your questions for the character and, and intentions in those scenes are going to be. But especially because you come from such a broad background across screen and theater and each project and each character and each process kind of requires something a little bit different. I was interested when you first started working on the show, kind of how you found that to be the process that works best for this character and for this show. Yeah, I mean, it, as with every project, it sort of develops and changes, you know, project to character to character, project to project. And I find that has as well with Shiv, it's, it's, it's evolved in a way that um, where I might, might need it to have, at the beginning of the season, take more detailed notes, at the beginning of the series, really take more detailed notes. And then you sort of get into the rhythm of it. And then, you know, come fourth season, it's not as detailed, but then you still have to, for me at least, I still do have to go back to like, how do I start this? And I have found less, um, more questions to be asked, which is which is great, rather than, the details necessarily of the scene uh it drifts throughout the the progress of the of the season but um that's yeah once i feel sort of more in the groove it's 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 better to sort of like disrupt that groove with questions than um try and uh feel insulated by details you know i mean also because one of one of the brilliant things about the writing on this show and in particular with shiv is the intention of any line of dialogue can be so many different things because there's always so many calculations going into her. You know, if you take that line where she's telling Tom, I love you, but I don't love you, you could have played yeah. that 20 different ways at least. Um, and so kind of how do you kind of take a lot of moments of dialogue like that where it really could go in so many different directions and figure out ultimately which direction and which intention it's gonna be for Shiv? Yeah, I mean, that one, that particular line, I found it really difficult to work on at home. I didn't really know what they wanted, I guess. Like, what do you mean by this? Is she, does she or doesn't she? Like, I've always thought she does, but then also in her own way. And so, and I, that one I kind of left up to Mark, Jesse, the gods of, of drama. I don't know, just kind of like, let's see on the day whether this works. And if it really doesn't, then we'll do something else and get rid of it or, or like, I'll need to reach out for a more firm direction or something. But, um, but yeah, I, I do find that like problems to be solved are often better solved by throwing it out to com like to committee, to the jury on, on the outside or to, to just looking to what your fellow actor, particularly Matthew is brilliant, is doing and, and seeing if it makes sense in the moment in that way. And yeah. And, and, oh, it suddenly does. It sounds, horrible to say I love you but I don't you know but <laughs> somehow in that sort of context it makes sense you can kind of make it fit there yeah. you also mentioned that you know the idea of kind of looking to people outside for their interpretations as well and mm -hmm. you talked a lot about how your husband's a really great resource as well because it's that's someone who's not in the midst of the day-to-day -day of the show but still has yeah. a lot of investment in the character um and so what yeah. is some Places where that's been really helpful to talk to someone who knows the character but kind of isn't on set every single day to kind of really figure out some of the finesses of certain scenes. Yeah, I mean, he's great. He's also got such a, as you said, like if he's not there every day, he's got a different um, perspective. But he's also good about like um, kind of he, he's able to make these connections that I just have missed because I'm because I'm so more familiar, I guess, with it. Like how particularly with the family dynamic of like Shiv as a sister to brothers and how that fits in the, uh, the how, how that can relate again to the world of like whatever the small microcosm is to the, the broader family dynamic. Um, it's not even an instance like directly you know, from, from the third season, but I know just recently with, with stuff that we've done on the fourth that uh, there's been times where I'm like, oh, that's very good actually. <laughs> you know, like, you know, sort of, like it's a nice thing to be, knocked off course uh and then just or, or having to defend something or debate something is, is really good with with uh with somebody that you love and that you sort of you get along with in in that kind of uh cerebral way as well great 
I also wanted to talk a little bit about the aspect of, of kind of how research and character development is still always an ongoing process because, you know, at the beginning, it sounds like it would be more specific things like, and you've mentioned um, Lauren Greenfeld's book, Generation Wealth, which was like 25 years of studying, you know, ultra wealthy people and photographing them. Yeah. Things like that were a really great window. But then kind of now at this point, it'll be something like I'm listening to a podcast talking about, you know, the, the language used within the yoga industry and what would yeah. shift onto that in um and so what are the ways in which you find yourself maybe not even sitting down specifically with research details but just kind of being out in the world and just kind of responding to certain things in the way that it makes you think about your character oh totally i mean everything in a way is is a is a reference like even just watching like the dropout uh watching that and going what's the version of shiv doing that you know what's the version of like how is that a way that she would have, uh, what, is it an avenue that she could have taken or dreamt of taking like to get away from her family? Could she have done that? No. What would, what would be, be, what would the differences be? Or even, or being at like the Bowery Hotel and like we went for a drink there with a friend recently and uh, it, just being in the room, you're like, sometimes you're like, who are these people? <laughs> like, there are some real sort of like, there were these young kids there and there were, they would like literally like they actually said, What shoes are they? Like, oh, they're they're McQueen's, but I usually wear Ferragamos. So I'm like, who cares? What are you talking about? Like, this is an actual conversation. This isn't a conversation. This is like I don't know. I and you know, all power to them, whatever. But just I, I, I yeah, there are there are inspirations in life everywhere, you know, and if you just sort of have it on your mind, then anything can be an influence. Uh, you know, and, and talking a little bit about the the sibling dynamic as well and how that relates into the dialogue, you know, it really influences this incredibly fast paced element when it's all of them together in a group. There's a lot of kind of overlapping moments, the way that they're kind of each trying to to see that balance of power, even just within a conversation, even if they're not talking about anything to do with business or anything important. Um, and I was interested in how you've kind of found even more of an adeptness and even more of a rhythm with that as time has gone on, because I'm sure at the beginning, there was a little bit of an adjustment in kind of figuring out what does this look like? Where's the overlap coming? What's the pacing of this dynamic? Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. I, we, we did the scene the other day that was uh, a pretty um, big milestone for us and, and working, you know, the three of us together. And, and Mark, at the end of it, his, his comment was that um, the three of us working, it, it, to, to watch us working, the three of us together and seeing how, like, how easily fluid the relationship and the dynamics of, of, of performance can be, but then also that the technical awareness is always there to to be able to shepherd the the, the story as well as the, the, the cameras and, and, and all the things that you sort of, you want to be working together and you want to not be thinking of and you want to be second nature, but that um, doesn't necessarily come unless you've got great chemistry with, with both the technical and the, the cast uh, in front of the camera on the day and uh, that's something that I think has been not it hasn't been hard won by any means in, in this production it, it feels like it's come easily but then sometimes you go you have to um take stock of it I think you have to sort of like uh not take it for granted <laughs> is the thing yeah um you know because like you could be I, 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 and I've had this experience where you sort of you're working on, on on a different project and with different people and suddenly the things that you thought were were natural secondhand the so second nature like a sort of a a communication that everybody has is not there and go oh wow we're so lucky working on this show with each other that we we understand each other so well and we work together so well um and it's not that they can't be there on a different different project or show it's just um it's yeah it's you know six years of working together that we've found it through you know I love that because there's there's always so many different dynamics at play and so many elements of duality and and one of those is obviously we're watching grown up adults in a discourse and yet it's also watching a bunch of children. Um, oh yeah, kind of the way that the way that that jumps between those two spaces of we can be talking about something very important, we can be talking about huge amounts of money and power and investment, and then at the same time, you know, I'm ribbing you for something that you did when you were five years old. Um, is there kind of like a consciousness in in the ways in which they become very juvenile and they become these child versions of themselves and the adult versions, or is it just so much of it in the writing and what you were just saying? about that that dynamic that after several years kind of naturally flows together yeah I think it's a lot about the relationship that we already have with 
with each other. I mean, and my relationship with Kieran, my friendship with Kieran is <laughs> somewhat of a sibling-ish, I guess, relationship similar to the Shiv Roman, but, you know, obviously much kinder, uh, much more loving. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, 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 the way in which like Jesse in particular is able to, to blend the, the familial and the, um, friendship and the business dynamics, I think, you know, it's such a testament to his writing that half the time on a first pass of the read, I'm like, I don't really know what's going on here. I know there's like some sort of shareholder-y, takeover-y, something, something, but I do know that he hates him. Like, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a human element that we all understand from watching it, even if we're not totally picking up on all the details of the business. And then, you know, you, you get the details of the business and you go like, oh, well, I understand why he doesn't like him, but I definitely knew that it was, uh, I definitely knew that's what was going on. You know, there's like, there's something that's recognizable everywhere. And something that's quite interesting with, with your performance in particular as well is that you kind of almost assume that like that push for power and that push for ambition would come with kind of a slightly more kind of outward energy, but with Shiv, it, it goes very inward a lot of the time. And there's a real observational quality and a real stillness that she's able to use as a great power play. And I was interested in where you found that from in her as a character early on when you first took her on. Yeah, I mean, that definitely came from me just being uncomfortable on set in an American accent, having to improvise against people who I thought were far better actors than I am. So, so it was like, it was more just a, a protective actory thing to keep my mouth shut uh, when I didn't think I had anything to say that was going to be any good. Um, but also made sense in that, like, you know, there's there's so much more you can do with a look or a feeling or a energy than just having to speak um, and just trusting that the camera will find it and that that'll be interesting as, as long as it's filled and expanded within, expanded into, you know, um, and that then, yeah, developed into a, into a choice as well. Um, she sort of is in some ways front footed and likes to emulate Logan. Um, and I think, you know, it's, everyone everyone all the kids will have their own opinion but um i feel like she was quite similar to logan and maybe the most similar to logan in like sort of like a concise cutting kind of way um but there's also like the the opposite sort of sitting back watching everything first before she jumps but then also like she'll open her mouth and blab at, at the dinner at, like the pierce dinner you know like she's got <laughs> she's hot-headed as well so. i love what you're saying there about trusting that the camera will find it because I was interested if that's a really unique aspect on this show of, of it being easier to just really trust that aspect, because obviously a lot of times you're shooting with three cameras, there's the real handheld, almost kind of documentary style element mm. of the way that it's filmed. And so it really does feel when you're watching the show, like the camera is following the characters rather yeah. than needing to feel specifically blocked, even though I'm sure that you are blocking out specific motions and scenes. Um, and how does that open up the space in which you feel like you have a lot of freedom to play within your performance and within scenes, just knowing if I was going to go over here, but I go over here and I move this way, the camera is going to follow me and it's going to find it, or at least one or three of them will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely the, the, um, the freedom to move is, is, uh, I have, you know, it's enormously, uh, powerful, I think, for, for performance, because it means that, like, you sort of, you, the pressure's off, in a way, it's like, they catch it or they don't, but you're not performing to a camera, you're not sort of thinking about what the director can see, is this my good angle, is this my, oh, better keep the chin up, or that, like, you can't actually protect your sort of, like, ego in a in a way of shooting in, this, like, this, this format, uh, and it makes you concentrate more on the person opposite you, and, and, and actually act the scene with the person opposite you, rather than, like, open up to camera and, and keep your sort of face in a way that you might think would look good on the other side. I don't know, like you, you really have to just sort of do away with your ego in that sort of sense. Um, and and we do we do block, but we it, it is often kept with a sort of general freedom to to move if 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 we so desire. But it's you know it's whatever serves the script. You know, it's not like just going to run out the door just because you feel like it it's like <laughs> it's not going to work the script doesn't say that so there's there's parameters and there's there's room to move within that yeah. 
And with some of what you were saying before as well, in terms of moments where Shiv will be kind of like closer to the center of things and sometimes a little bit further back, I, I wanted to ask you a bit about some of her body language and, and some of the physical elements of her as a character, because there's there's moments where it seems like she feels quite comfortable with certain mannerisms or certain kind of interactions with people from a physical body language sense. And then there's moments where it's just kind of, how do I act in this body in this way? Like if we take that that scene at the end of the, the finale with Kendall, where I remember you just kind of putting your hand on his head but she's not even looking at him and it's it's kind yeah. of just a very awkward head pat of like I think this is what I'm supposed to do um and yeah. so you what where do you find those moments of, of feeling like she feels quite comfortable in terms of how to act and what to do in that way and moments where you want the body language to feel a little bit more foreign to her yeah I mean sometimes it's like what would I do as in what would Sarah do and then she would do the complete opposite like if someone <laughs> my brother a friend anybody was crying in the dirt I would be like what do you need They'll give you a big hug let's get you some water let's get you out of the sun so what's the opposite of that I don't know keep your phone in your hand and pat gently like I don't think she just doesn't have the capacity from a learnt childhood kind of way to 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 she doesn't have the archive to draw on you know like she's just like yeah there's a there's a there's a protective sort of shield around her I guess and similar with 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 her and Tom I think there's not there's not much incidental affectionate kind of uh kissing or hugging or like leaning or anything like that it's very like held and tightly bound apart from each other um and uh yeah I forgot the beginning part of the question sorry kind of like when she feels comfortable and when it's just very very foreign oh her. whether it's a choice yeah I, I mean I think it's I think it's more of like a natural inclination I guess like you know the, people I've, I've had people say like oh you've got such great posture she's and I'm like I feel like she's got good posture I don't I'm, I'm not I don't have good posture I forget I'm all hunched shoulders and slouchy but she but something about like putting the character on with the shoes and the dresses and the attitude just makes her stand up straight really yeah. yeah i mean that that scene with kendall as well is so great in regards to the fact that the way that these siblings behave with each other at the end of the day there's still there still is an evident undercurrent of love even if they don't know how to express it and that scene is such an amalgamation of you know i love you and i care about you and and what you're telling me but also business is happening and there's other stuff that I need to take care of for self-preservation um, yeah and and do you feel like again kind of like just with the idea of fluidity of different intonations of the character within scenes that you found even more ways to kind of really flow between those two dynamics of you know this is the Shiv that really cares and about her family and really loves them and then this is the Shiv that's just kind of very very tunnel visioned and focused because she jumps back and forth so quickly sometimes yeah I mean Yes, but not as um, sort of planned out, I guess, as that. And also taking in, which for, for, for Brian playing Logan, he's often been asked, does he love his children? And he says, absolutely, he loves his children. He just shows it in a different way. And I think there's a, there's a world in which that's similar for Shiv. And like her, uh, yes, it is self, self-preservation. Yes, we need to get this business sort of thing protected. Yes, we need to go and confront doubt about it. But it's also like, in some ways, I'm doing this for everybody. You know, like, yes, it's good for Shiv in this moment, but it's also good for everybody. Like, we are all going to be, we, you know, we, we're all going to be on, out in the street if we don't do this. So there's, I think there's a different way of showing love, I think, uh, showing up um, and being sort of more um, available emotionally is, is definitely a good way to show love. <laughs> but, um, but like, following through with the task in hand to Shiv, I think, is how she reads, in a way, love and, and expressing that, yeah. And in the, in the same way that we were talking about the, those instances and, and those beats that kind of harken back to the juvenile version of, of Shiv with her siblings, with her dad as well, you know, there's, there's more subtle versions of that. And so for you, what are the ways in which Shiv kind of becomes infantized by interactions mm. with dad and sometimes even just the way that he talks to her or kind of knows how to switch her buttons? Yeah, I mean, that's just Brian, really, in the end. Like, he, he I really love that dynamic. That, like, I love the way that, um, you know, she occupies this different space. She's got a nickname. She's got, like, 
Is that the brown or something? I don't know. But she's got one. It's pinky. You know, like there's a sort of special quality there, and that comes through when we do scenes together. It's like a way in which we can interact on a on a yeah business level but then like it naturally switches into this sort of fatherly paternal paternal quality um and you know how can you not brian's so lovely and 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 occupies that space in in, in so many ways in like regular life as well you know uh so it's yeah that i find kind of quite easy it just sort of like it's fluid yeah, yeah. and because she is someone who you know what like you were saying before has has a lot of walls up and finds it very difficult to show vulnerabilities there's times where you know I'm sure that it's like she does genuinely feel this confident and there's times where she knows how to kind of put that front on and, and put those walls up and so for you what are some of the really kind of minute nuanced differences in how you're playing her when it's a it's a genuine confidence versus when you know that actually it's masking something else underneath for her yeah, I mean that that often comes in with the script if there's like if there's something that I know that, but also with that that's tricky because we're only getting one script at a time. So sometimes there's like a scene that will come later in like let's say like an episode five, and I'll pick back to something that happened in episode two. But like, damn it, I really could have seeded this in a different kind of way, but you can't. I mean, like, you know, real people don't know what's going to happen in real life. Um, so actors who are playing characters shouldn't necessarily also but um there's a there's a different sort of she's quite good at being um pretending to be confident so it, it is difficult to to show like a, a shade of like that that nuanced of um not necessarily being uh fully in herself in this moment part of that like that i found a way to like achieve that is is using the cameras around like the public public private mask kind of thing um because you can then be in a space and that someone can see but the camera can see but the person can't um those kinds of things uh there's also there's also just audiences are really smart <laughs> you know like they could see i think cumulatively for an episode that like oh she looked like she was really confident there but she can't have been because that just happened something like that or or you know and also mark the director for a lot of them uh he's quite good at like connective tissue stuff so he'll have even if it's not scripted he'll um try and shoot pieces where the characters we see them by themselves we see them in a moment of contemplation we see them in a moment between something walking across a corridor a foyer so there's an opportunity there not just to be like, right, now I'm going from A to B, what's my motivation? Just walk through this door. Just think about something, just sort of like use it as a as a, as a transition moment for a character um, so that nothing's wasted and so that we see, we get those moments for the audience to go like, okay, well, she's thinking something different here. We don't, you know, we don't know what yet. We're going to see what's going to happen next, but maybe this is a clue. Yeah. And with the fact that, that, like you were just saying, you really are only getting one script at a time and you don't always have the whole cumulative arc of where something's going, are there challenges that come with that in playing a character who's very good about positioning herself for the long game and being very strategic where it's, okay, she's she's doing this now and you're not quite sure where it's going, but obviously as a character, she knows why she's laying the foundation for something that might pay off three episodes later or, you know, a few weeks later for her as a character. Yeah, I mean... Jesse knows these characters so well and so do all the, the writers that and and Jesse I think I don't know whether he's, he he said this before in an interview that um he doesn't really believe that people can change. And I disagree, but also agree as well. Um <laughs> but I I guess within that then the framework of that you can kind of expect that the characters are gonna do a similar kind of mess up. They're gonna like they're going to stitch themselves up in the same kinds of way. They're they're going to be presented with different obstacles and different um, conflicts, but there's something that is that is them still doing this problem. And it, it would be nice to sort of think that you're smarter than that and set things up, but in the end, people maybe don't change as much as as, as we think they do, and certainly not in like a three episode arc or a four episode, five episode arc, maybe from the beginning to the end of a season, but you're kind of in good hands with these writers to, to protect you from making too many wrong decisions, or at least in a better sense, listening to the decisions you make and changing the scripts ahead of time according to those things. You know, a lot of the scripts 
don't come in until late because they are consciously listening to us on set and making sure that like everything that happens in episode eight still is relevant to what happened and the choices that were made by the actors in episode three. And they got our back. <laughs> what one of the scenes I also really loved in, in intricate moments at the end of the season was the dynamic with Shiv's mom as well at the wedding mm. um, and that conversation that they had outside where her mom's essentially blaming her for the fact that they didn't have a closer relationship like well you chose your dad so I just wiped my hands and left and it was your fault and yeah. your, you had to twist the knife in even when you were 10 years old um and how did how did going into a scene like that and playing that scene and even just reading it in the script influence the dynamic for how you wanted to give the speech at the dinner at the wedding because that's something where she's kind of masking the truth with humor and but still saying it out loud in front of a whole bunch of people and then saying some maybe or maybe not sincere things at the end about how like you know but I still love you yeah yeah I can't actually remember which one was shot first but they but again it's that thing of like the relationship with the what the one thing I found really amazing actually that came as a discovery within the scene with the the onion scene with mum was like this real understanding that actually it wasn't about it was the scene in some ways yes it's it's with with Harriet with with Caroline and it is a you know it's a scene about daughter mother relationship motherhood daughterhood but actually it become it became about like it became about dad unfortunately in that scene because it suddenly occurred to me that actually dad didn't want us. It was, it was a way to win. It was a way that like, then that scene threads into the final scene of, of episode of season three, where it's on display. It's, it's nothing, it was never about us children at all. It was about winning. It was about, uh, I have a prize and I want to keep it and you're not allowed it. So I'll create a narrative that supports that. And then, Caroline's on the outside of that, not being a particularly naturally maternal person in the first place, and folds. And so it sets up this situation that the kids then live through and believe their dad's narrative, which was that mum didn't really want us. And that's not necessarily true at all. Um, so I, what I love about it, though, is like you get this space of freedom to create inside the scene. And because we're playing these characters that feel so rich and complex and the relationships are really thought out and there's so much stimulus, you can really just like play in your own brain. Like your imagination has got a real fertile feeding ground to just create stuff. So then working with, with someone like Harriet as well and, you know, working with one in the morning, we're shooting in this beautiful spot in Cortona, but they spent two hours lighting it because it was too beautiful. You know, it's really like by that stage, you're like, I'm kind of annoyed. But that's perfect for the scene. Like maybe they did that on purpose. <laughs> and and speaking of that, that final scene of the entire season, what was your approach going into that, especially kind of knowing, okay, then the camera's gonna be on me. And did you know that it was gonna fade to black on you in that moment as well? No, not at all. No. No, no. And when I saw the episode and that that's what they were chose that's what they had chosen. Like I'm inside the character. Like I know what she's thinking. I read the scripts. I've like I will be one of the first to know with when episode four like season four starts but then when I saw that final episode I was like oh no they can't what's gonna happen like, what there's it such a lyrical there's like a rhythm to where they cut and how they the scene and it, yeah I was really impressed with what they managed to with what you know Mark and everybody created out of that um but that scene was meant to finish on the page with with Matthew um, with Tom having his shoulder tapped and you just see a shiv and that's it and then doesn't come into the room doesn't have all of that sort of uh, interaction at all but Mark is quite good at leaving the cameras rolling until something happens and maybe we'll never use it but it's nice and informative for us as actors and as camera people as well moving around to see if there's something else we're missing in the scene or, or something else for the actors to mine or something else for them to add for a storyline later. That was like the Jerry Roman thing where both of them, the camera kept rolling and both of them were looking at it, checking each other out <laughs> as they walked away. That, you know, that was not a written scripted thing, but like comes from letting the cameras roll a little bit to finish, to feel like, you know, like you close the scene. And so in this instance, that similar thing happened. Um, 
where Matt, yeah, Matthew enters the room, Tom comes in and, and you just, yeah, you play out what are the next beats? What's the fallout? What do you, what do you do next? Um, and, you know, the proximity of Tom in that moment while Shiv is still working out whether, whether he has genuinely betrayed her or if this is like, what is, what have I just seen? What are the questions here? There's no answers actually. There's just too many. It's like, well, dad's abandoned us. He, mom's abandoned us. Is it my husband as well? Where do I have to go now? This is not, this is the worst. This is like exactly what I predicted as a young girl and I can't believe it's come true. Fuck you all. <laughs> like, it's like the fence is going back up. Fine. I never loved you anyway. You know, it's that little kid. Well, it's it, it's such a great scene and there's so many kind of incredible things that you've done in, in making this such an intricately complex character over the seasons can't wait to see everything that you're working on in production right now for the next season thank you so much Sarah thanks for having me